Aunt Mary did it. My niece clearly accused me of pushing her down the stairs of a pedestrian overpass. But I had taken a day off to pamper myself for the beauty day, going to hair salons and nail places downtown. There's no way I could have been at the overpass near my home due to time constraints. Nevertheless, my Cillan husband believed my niece, and I was cast out, losing my place in the family. I went back to my parents' house, where my dad pointed out several inconsistencies in the situation. It was then that I realized the story was full of holes. I started taking action to resolve that contradiction. My name is Mary. I'm 33 years old. I've been married to my husband, George, who is 35, for three years, and we live with my mill. We've been married for three years now, but we don't have any children. We've been trying to conceive since our first year of marriage but haven't been successful. My mill, eager to see a grandchild, often pressures me with questions like, when will you have a baby? I want to try fertility treatments, but George is uncooperative, even explicitly stating he won't contribute financially. At this rate, we're never going to have kids, and the tension from my mill just keeps escalating. Lately, it seems like my husband doesn't even want to talk about having children. He's been coming home later and later. Even when he does come home, he's pretty distant, and it's fair to say our marriage has cooled off significantly. My niece Sophie, the seven-year-old daughter of my Bill and Syl, is my solace. My brother-in-law's family lives about a 10-minute drive from our in-law's place, and they often come over for a visit. When they do, my brother-in-law is often busy and not at home. So it's usually just my sister-in-law, Amanda, and little Sophie who come by. Sophie has really taken a liking to me, and we sometimes go out together when our schedules align. For me, someone without children, Sophie is a real treasure. So when we go out, I can't help but buy her treats and toys. Sometimes Amanda chides me, could you not spoil Sophie so much? Even so, what Sophie wants or likes are usually trivial things. I often find myself asking, is this really all you want? At the toy store, when I ask if she wants something, she usually shakes her head no. But when I ask what she'd like to do, she just wants to go to one of those vending machine corners and spend three bucks on a small toy. And she's happy with just one. Even when I say she doesn't have to hold back because she's with me, she never asks for more. Watching her cherish a toy from a simple vending machine makes me a bit sentimental. Maybe it's just me. So I don't really think I'm spoiling her in a way that should make Amanda mad. And lately, I get the feeling that Sophie wants to talk about something when we go out, just the two of us. Sophie, if there's anything you want to talk about, just let me know. Even though I tried reaching out, Sophie never really opened up about what might be on her mind. Why is that? I wish she'd just tell me. It's so frustrating not knowing. Also, I might be overthinking, but I feel like Sophie's lost some weight and her complexion looks off. Maybe she's been feeling under the weather because of the summer heat. So I asked Amanda. Amanda, has Sophie lost some weight lately? She looks a bit pale. Do you think it's just summer fatigue? Oh, really? I haven't noticed anything unusual. Maybe you're just overthinking. She didn't seem concerned at all. Really? She seemed not herself before the summer break. I figured Sophie wouldn't talk even if I asked. I wonder how I can get her to open up to me. Despite my efforts, all I could think of was to treat her to her favorite foods. Yet, if I had pushed a bit harder then, she might not have been involved in the upcoming incident. That day, I took a day off for a long-awaited beauty day. I had back-to-back -back appointments, hair salon in the morning, nail salon after, and then lash lift. Around afternoon, as I was heading to the lash salon, I got a call from my husband. Sophie's been injured and taken to the hospital. I'm on my way. Please come quickly, Mary. What? Sophie's hurt. I quickly canceled my lash appointment and rushed to the hospital. Upon arrival, my husband, Amanda, and Mill were already there. My Bill was on a business trip and wasn't there yet. Is Sophie okay? Is she alright? In response, my husband said, Yell. Yeah.
She's stable for now. What a relief. But what happened to Sophie? I was completely clueless. But once Sophie woke up, everything changed. Even knowing she was stable, it wasn't reassuring until she woke up. As the hours went by, Sophie finally woke up in the evening. Amanda rushed to Sophie's side. Sophie, two voices echoed. My husband and I, along with my mill, decided to enter the hospital room after a while. Once the doctor's examination was done and Amanda and Sophie had calmed down, we were called in. Then, Sophie made a shocking statement. We walked into the room, and Amanda said to Sophie, Sophie, there's someone in here who hurt you, right? Can you tell us? What was Amanda talking about? I didn't understand her words. However, Sophie raised her arm pointed at me and said, it was Aunt Mary. She declared that outright. What? Why me? This was the first time I met Sophie today. Amanda began to speak to my puzzled face. Sophie says that when she was going down the stairs of the pedestrian bridge on Main Street, Mary pushed her from behind. Sophie, you saw Aunt Mary, didn't you? Yes. Sophie responded softly. Maybe I know the pedestrian bridge she's referring to but I had spent the day at the hair salon and then the nail salon. I couldn't possibly have returned to our neighborhood's pedestrian bridge. I tried desperately to explain. I was out towards the train station all day. I couldn't have been near our house. You can call the hair and nail salon to verify my whereabouts. But Amanda didn't seem convinced, thinking it wasn't good for Sophie to see adults arguing. My mill suggested we discuss outside the room. Now we couldn't get the truth from Sophie. The only one who knew the truth was Sophie. Outside the room, Amanda confronted me even more. Mary, what's with you? Taking out your frustration of not having a child on Sophie. You are so fond of Sophie and yet you do this. If she had landed badly, she might not be with us now. If indeed Sophie had fallen down the stairs, that might be true, but I swear I never did such a thing. I didn't do it. I was really at the hair salon and nail salon. You keep saying that. If those are your regular places, wouldn't they vouch for you even if you weren't there? I can't believe. My husband, who had been listening, chimed in. I can't trust Mary anymore. Making Sophie go through this. It's madness. Can't believe I've been married to someone like this. Amanda joined in. Indeed, it's good that Ryan has been okay until now. But poor Sophie facing such a tragedy. Mary, I can't do this with you anymore. I want a divorce. What? I was utterly lost. I hadn't done anything to Sophie. And out of the blue. I was being accused and now facing a divorce. The situation spiraled so fast that I was in complete shock. Anyway, the divorce is final. The past three years with you have been a total waste. You'll pay for the time you stole from me. I'll be in touch about the divorce papers and alimony. Get out of here ASAP. Sophie probably doesn't even want to see your face. He pushed me aside and I had no choice but to leave. In the end, I couldn't go back to my sister-in-law Amanda's, so I decided to return to my parents' house. Seeing me return unexpectedly, my parents were shocked. I told them everything that happened today, without hiding any detail. I had been at the spa in the town center. Sophie had been pushed down from the upper stairs of a pedestrian bridge near our house. I was being treated as the culprit. Ryan is demanding a divorce and alimony. Now, having nowhere else to go, I had returned here. Thankfully, my parents seemed to believe my story. They had some pressing questions, though. If you were really the culprit, Mary, why didn't they call the police? We would have informed them the moment we knew Sophie fell. And how can they be so sure you did it? Sophie was going down the stairs, right? If she was pushed from behind, she wouldn't have seen the culprit's face, would she? Also, isn't Ryan taking Sophie's word a bit too seriously? Demanding a divorce without concrete proof. Could he have another reason to want out? My father listed these doubts like a detective. Hearing them calmly, I realized he had a point. If I were in Amanda's place, 
I'd have called the police immediately. Yet, they just accused me and let me leave. Did they not want to catch me? The more I thought about it, the fishier it sounded. Could it be that Ryan and Amanda are plotting something? I was so glad I'd shared everything with my parents. My next step would be to investigate Ryan and Amanda. So, I decided to hire a private investigator. The next day, I received a message from Ryan. I've already filed for divorce. So, as of now, you and I are no longer husband and wife. Also, for wasting my time living with someone like you for three years, you owe me $3,000 in alimony, that's $1,000 for each year. Transfer it to my account ASAP. Got it. Seeing that message, I thought, hold on a minute. He'd already filed for divorce. Does that mean he's fudged my signature? That's a crime. I immediately texted back. Filing a false divorce document is a crime. I'm calling the cops. He replied almost instantly. Do you even realize what you've done? If you get the cops involved, you'll be the one getting arrested. Keep your mouth shut and transfer the alimony now. This was getting more and more suspicious. I thought it was high time to expedite the private investigator's probe. One week later, the investigation into my husband and Mill was complete. Reading the report, everything clicked, and I realized Sophie was in danger. First things first, I had to rescue Sophie, who should still be in the hospital. I called the police, and we headed to the hospital together. This was perfect timing. I could speak directly to Sophie, and hospital staff seemed to have something to share with the police too. In the meantime, one officer and I spoke to Sophie. Sophie, how are you feeling? I'm not hurting as much anymore. Is that from falling down the stairs or from the bruises your mom gave you? Sophie's face turned pale instantly. How? How do you know my mom hit me? Mary here did some digging for you. Neighbors reported hearing you cry several times. And the hospital staff confirmed that in addition to the fresh bruises, you have older ones as well. That's from your mom, right? Sophie gave a slight nod. With this testimony from Sophie, she will likely be taken into protective custody by the police. This should ensure her safety. A police officer who had spoken to the hospital staff returned, confirming the obvious abuse from the numerous old bruises on Sophie. Consequently, Sophie was taken from the hospital into police protection. I then headed to my in-law's house. Sure enough, my husband and sister-in-law were there. As expected, my husband and Amanda were there. What are you doing here, Mary? Ryan barked. You have no right to be here. He seems to think I'm in the dark about everything. I confronted him with the private investigator's report. You are rushing our divorce because of this affair right? She's pregnant, isn't she? That's right. My husband, Ryan, had been having an affair for about a year, and he recently found out his mistress was pregnant. Once he knew about the pregnancy, he decided to finally break up with me and dodge paying any alimony for his infidelity. He even thought about taking money from me. So, he came up with a scheme using Sophie, my niece. Ryan knew that Amanda, my sister-in-law, was abusing Sophie. He probably used that knowledge to ask Amanda for her cooperation. He likely promised Amanda a cut of the money he would extort from me, allowing her free reign to use Sophie. Motivated by greed and already mistreating Sophie, Amanda agreed to cooperate. So, the perpetrators of Sophie's fall were Ryan, who planned it, and Amanda, who carried it out. Amanda then pressured Sophie to falsely accuse me, making Sophie the actual victim here. But in the end, I'm grateful to Sophie for telling me the truth. Otherwise, I'd have been stuck paying alimony to Ryan. When I confronted Ryan and Amanda, they were visibly shaken but tried to bluff saying, you have no proof we did it. However, once I revealed that Sophie was under police protection based on the hospital staff statements, 
They were visibly defeated. I then had waiting cops come in and arrest them. By the way, my mill had nothing to do with this plot. She'll learn the truth from the police and realize I'm innocent. So, what happened next? Ryan and Amanda are looking at a long stint in jail for their various crimes. Both our families are now officially divorced. I demanded alimony from Ryan for his cheating, which his mom paid since he's in jail. I also successfully got compensation from my husband's mistress. You might think it's low to get money from her while she's pregnant, but pregnant or not, cheating is wrong. I went ahead and asked for the compensation specifically to make that point clear. She has decided to raise the child alone, which might be for the best. On the other hand, as for the brother-in-law and his wife, of course, the bill gained custody, and it was decided that Sophie would live with him. He seems to have switched from his previously hectic job to one that's more flexible in terms of time. Also, it appears that he's asked for compensation from his wife for Sophie. Since his wife couldn't afford the payments, it looks like her parents ended up footing the bill. While money can't heal emotional wounds, It'll help with Sophie's counseling fees. As for me, I feel liberated being away from Ryan and my mill. I plan to continue my work and also spend more time supporting Sophie. I want to help her along with her dad so she can someday smile from the bottom of her heart.